Hi, Jeremy here, Modern Vitality. Today's video is the perfect poop. We're gonna be talking about bowel health. If your bowel movements aren't up to snuff, right? If you don't have the perfect poop, <laughs> this isn't so you can feel like ashamed and embarrassed and all that. We're just looking at something clinically and with curiosity because with complex chronic health conditions, which is what we focus on on this channel and basically my work is all aimed at helping people with these like uh, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, adrenal fatigue, mold exposure, reactivated Epstein-Barr, candida, EMF sensitivity. I mean, you name it, right? There's a ton of stuff happening now. Long haulers, it's a relatively new one. People are getting these clusters of just odd symptoms that are all over the map. Well, this is what we focus on here. And one of them happens to be digestion and bowel health. Because even with those conditions that tend to have uh, fatigue, brain fog, like weird pains, insomnia, libido changes, anxiety, depression, all that, those tend to all cluster together along with digestive issues. IBS or irritable bowel syndrome is another diagnosis that gets kind of thrown in, especially with fibromyalgia. It's one of these comorbid diagnoses, which means that a lot of people have that as well. Okay. What I'm here to tell you is that the way your bowels are acting is not necessarily a separate and distinct thing from the rest of your health, right? I know this is earth shattering news, but you're connected. Your body is a system of systems. One of those systems poop comes out of, which is great because we can look at that. We can look at the stools, right? We can take a good look and we can start to get information from that output about what the system is doing, what the processes are happening in there and how that may affect other things like fatigue, brain fog, pain. Like, did you know that your bowel movements may be associated with the way that your brain is functioning or your energy level or the pains you're feeling? Fascinating stuff. All right, let's get started. So while bowel movements and poop, right, it's a taboo topic, I do not shy away from taboo topics. I encourage everybody I work with, like even our group, we talk a lot about taboo stuff. It's an open forum so that we can do that because where there is taboo, oftentimes there's a lot of information. Taboos, paradoxes, these kinds of things are rich places to look and learn. So when we have bowel movements, I'll tell you, the first thing that you should understand is like the perfect poop, okay? In Eastern medicine, which is where I have a strong background, we look at the, the perfect poop and it's not just the actual stool that comes out, but also the process of how you get that stool out. So we're gonna talk about it from a couple of different angles. So first, the actual stool, right? It should be well-formed, meaning it's not a bunch of soup or like peanut butter consistency, right? You don't wanna see undigested food in there. That's important. Okay. These are all signs, by the way, anything that deviates from the norm is, is information. It's not a judgment and a shame thing. You know, it's, we're not here to like downgrade people because your poops are weird or whatever, but we want to use that information as you deviate from the norm. The way you deviate will tell us a lot about what's going on inside because undigested food doesn't just appear in your stool, right? That happens for reasons. So we need to understand that. Okay. It should be easy to, easy to pass, well-formed, right? Not a huge, strong odor either. There should be some, you know, some odor, most likely, right? It is feces, but it shouldn't be like, uh, you know, you need to burn the bathroom down afterwards, you know, put up caution tape, right? If there's a big, strong odor, that's telling us a lot about the microbiome activity that's in there. Of course, right? What you eat can influence this. You want to look further upstream. This is also really, really important. So your stools should be daily, at least. If you're going multiple days without having a bowel movement, there's most likely an issue there. Why is it so slow? It should be easy to pass, meaning you don't have to push or strain or hold your breath to do that. So for example, if you do have to um, hold your breath, like you, you want to have a bowel movement and you go, and then you bear down and like push that thing out, right? That's telling us that there are some problems with the motility of the intestines. There's some kind of blockage. There's, there's something going on where you are having to recruit pressure from your lungs Right? That when you, that's what happens when you hold your breath, you're creating this pressure in your lungs and, and then using that pressure to help push it out. Right, It shouldn't have to happen like that. It should be rather easy. I should also cover red flags too with stools. Like if you have constipation that goes on for, again, this I'm not your doctor, this isn't medical advice, right? Obviously you're a, a grown adult that's self-responsible and just trying to learn more about your health, especially within the context of a complex chronic health condition. But I will offer you too, some helpful information with red flags. Of course, blood in the stool. You want to know what's going on with that, right? And blood in the stool can be um, 
like fresh, bright red blood, which usually comes from the lower part. You know, it could even be a hemorrhoid, right? Or you could have some uh, bleeding in your colon, or it could be a darker blood that came from higher up in the GI tract. You want to have that looked at, right? Go talk to your doctor about that. Of course, you could have uh, constipation that lasts for a long time. Anytime there's constipation that stretches too long, you want to talk to your doctor about that because you may have something physically blocking your intestines. Now, this is one of those cases where you rule out you know, some of the more serious things like tumors because tumors are masses and they can grow and expand and they can start to push and block the colon. So you can get backed up because there's a tumor pressing. So no matter how much senna you take or laxatives or whatever, no matter how many coffee enemas you do or colonics, if there's a giant tumor growing in there, you need to know about that, right? Because the, the function of the bowel health is, is not gonna improve from an enema. You need to get the tumor handled, right? That would be the, the thing to do. Same thing with what they call pencil thin stools. Those are they literally like pencil thin and that's because the, the colon's getting blocked you know, almost all the way. So only a little bit can get through. So those kinds of things are more red flags. You need to talk to your, talk to your physician about that, right? Blood, total blockage, pencil thin stools, that kind of stuff. So make sure that you're being responsible with your health, right? That's important. You don't wanna miss something very severe and very serious. So there's that, okay, we did the red flags. Now, most of them, there's more. Uh, do your own research. So you want to have it easy to pass because if you're bearing down having to push, right, that's a sign, right? You can tell now it's not just the stool, but it's also the process of how that stool is coming out, right? Are you able to poop freely and easily? Okay. Now, some of this may be postural because our toilets in the West, right? We have toilets that put us in a seated position, just like I'm sitting in this chair. Uh, they have squatty potties and footstools and things you can do. You can look into these like types of products where it elevates your feet, which brings your knees up higher. And it puts you more in the, the position like how a toddler, if you, I mean, I have kids, I've seen this plenty, but where a toddler takes a squat and, you know, they, they find a way to rip their diaper off, right? That's the first step. And then they take a squat and they just poop on your floor, right? They're not doing it in a seated position like this. They're squatted down low. Their hips are open. So if you have trouble with the actual movement of the stool and you feel like that, oh, that bearing down thing, you might rule out just postural. So you might try to elevate your feet and your knees and see if you can get a deeper uh, bend in your hips and see if that helps the bowel movements come out a little easier without having to push. You don't wanna strain when you're going to the bathroom, right? You can blow blood vessel, you get hemorrhoids, right? People have had heart attacks on the toilet. I think there's a myth, I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a, at least a myth that that's how Elvis died, right, on the toilet. I have to look into that. I probably shouldn't say it and put it on the internet because I haven't fact checked it, right? But you can, if that's interesting to you. Uh, something to be aware of. You know, you don't want to be pushing and fighting your own body just to try to have a bowel movement. So if you're having that, right, that's going to tell us a lot about what's going on internally. And you, what you want to do is start to take not only the evidence of your stools and what it's like to have bowel movements and what those processes are, but you also want to start to look at other parts of your health. Like, what does your tongue look like? You know, I've got a video on that. What are What's your skin look like? What's your body type? What are the other symptoms, right? And you can start to get a sense of this whole picture. And then you can go stage by stage and go immune, digestive, neuroadrenal, blood circulation, right? And you can get everything sorted out going in order and comprehensively and you do it the right way. That way you're pooping better, right? Without having to necessarily take a bunch of laxatives. So there's that, right? We talked about the stool should be well-formed, easy to pass, uh, solid, right? Not all soupy. If they're all soupy, that's telling us about your digestive capacity. That's telling us about the bacteria that are in your guts. You don't always have to get a bacteria test right, to know what the, the makeup is. A lot of times we can kind of look and go, okay, this is a, a very damp stool coming out, right? It's like soup or uh, peanut butter, right? That tells us something about the conditions in the, in the colon and then we know what kinds of bacteria tend to favor those conditions. Same thing with the undigested stools or watery stools, right? We have undigested food in there. That's telling us that your digestive capacity isn't strong, right? You don't have the fire in there to break all that stuff down. So a lot of food, and I'm not talking about corn or peanuts here, right? Just like, you know, some things that um, should have been digested, but just aren't. And you can see that. And then you can know that you need to work on this. The metabolic fire is, is dwindling or it's low, or at least that's part of your condition. Some things you can do to help uh, chew your food really well, right? Uh, don't eat garbage, eat real food. Okay, that's gonna uh, look a little bit different to different people depending on your maybe culture, tradition, preference, right? But in general, if it comes in a package with an ingredients list, uh, you know, think twice or try to minimize that stuff so that you can have real food going through, which is what your body's actually designed to handle and make bowel movements out of. 
right? So you don't want that watery stool. You don't want undigested stools. You don't want it to be pasty. Uh, cleaning up afterwards, right, shouldn't be a huge ordeal. There was a, a guy who was making jokes about that. He said it's like wiping off the tip of a Sharpie. You know, you take the toilet paper. Every time you touch it, it's got more stuff on it. You know, that kind of thing. It's, it's messy and it's damp, right? So that's a sign about the intestines. It can go the other way too, right? You can have these, uh, they call them goat pellet stools, which is the, literally like little marbles of uh, feces come out. And if you ever had that, you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about, or I mean the name, the goat pellets, right? It's a pretty clear name, right? Goat pellet stools, what that's telling you is actually about your hydration level and your intestines are going slower, moving slower, and they're sucking more and more water out because it's part of the job of the large intestine is to recapture fluids from the bowel, right? So you're taking um, very wet Everything you eat is digested. It becomes very wet. They call it chyme, right? And then it starts to get absorbed, all the nutrients. And then the large intestine pulls some of the fluid out of there. Well, if the large intestine is moving very, very slowly and or your body is trying to pull more fluids out for various reasons, you can wind up with these like very, uh, they've been in the intestine for so long, they've been kind of like polished almost, right? And they come out and they're just these little round goat pellets. Okay, so what you see in the bowl, when you know how to interpret it, can tell you a lot about what's going on inside. Now, some people look at, oh, does it float or not, right? Does it matter? You know, I, I don't really differentiate with that. Eastern medicine doesn't tend to differentiate with that. I know some traditions, I think Ayurveda might differentiate with that. Um, not a huge deal from what I've seen clinically, if it floats or not. I think that may have to do more with the diet and like how much fat versus how much fiber you eat. Uh, I'm not entirely positive though. I'll, I'll just leave that one open. And uh, another one is the timing, right? So one bowel movement a day, bare minimum, okay? That's the minimum. Some people say uh, you should have a bowel movement like after every meal. I'm not entirely sure that it needs to be that clockwork, especially if you eat kind of irregularly, right? Because you've started eating, you know, and you've set yourself up. So there's going to be a bowel movement coming however many hours after your last meal, right? And then you're eating another one. But if you don't eat at regular intervals, then it's not always going to line up that way. So I try not to be too rigid or too anal, right? About bowel movement timing. But as long as it's at least once a day and ideally in the mornings, did you know that you can start to do bowel training? You can train yourself to have bowel movements in the morning if you don't already. Most people wake up, they have a bunch of coffee or some kind of stimulant, right? Caffeine thing, which is fine. I'm not going to judge you here, but that will give us a false reading because the, the caffeine just tricks your bowels into emptying, right? Which is one way to do it. But that's, what that's not telling us is what your body would have done naturally. So we're missing some information about your body's natural kind of instincts and tendencies because you're, you're masking that. You're not getting good data, right? If you use coffee all the time. So something to think about. And if you don't have bowel movements in the morning, you can train it even without coffee or without caffeine. You just wake up and then you go sit on the toilet, right? You give yourself an opportunity, okay? A poopertunity, we call it, right? It's a poopertunity. Even if you don't have to poop, you sit there on the toilet for a few minutes and you give yourself a chance because sometimes, I know this is, um, you know, not easy to think about, but sometimes we become so disconnected from our bodies that we actually did have to poop and we didn't even feel it. We're so tuned out, right? Or we have so many signals coming that our brain just chooses what to focus on. So you can actually train that if you give yourself a chance, right? A poopertunity, um, once a day, every morning, you know, at some point you may find that you start to sit on the toilet in the morning and something comes out and you go, wow, I didn't even know I had to go, you know, crazy. My caveat there is you're not sitting there trying to make it happen. You're not sitting there forcing and blowing out the veins in your side of your head, trying to get that morning poop because it's healthy, right? So you give yourself a heart attack. Don't do that, of course, but you give yourself the opportunity. Okay. Let, let it happen. Maybe not. Right. But you can train that actually over time and you'll start to sync up. The circadian rhythm is huge right? It's, it's to be respected. So there's a lot to consider with the perfect poop. Once you have a complex chronic health condition, though, you're going to have a context where multiple body systems are all having issues and leaning on each other. So we tend to go through, even if you have problems with your digestion, which means your perfect poop isn't happening, right? You're getting weird stuff going on one way or the other, or it's alternating, or it's all over the place. You're getting that. People tend to have this knee-jerk thing of going, okay, well, we'll just treat the digestive system. So here's some probiotics, here's some enzymes, here's a, an enema or here's a laxative thing or whatever it is. And that can work sometimes. Sometimes it's a short-term thing. There's no long-term medical independence happening because you haven't actually changed the system and how it's working inside, but you're kind of prompting results, right? Just like taking coffee to, to get yourself to poop. Sometimes it works. 
What I will say though, is that with complex chronic health conditions, the things that kind of like work for the general population usually aren't enough because you have a different system. You've got inflammatory things going on. You've got hidden pathogens. You've got, of course, digestive issues. As a result of that, there's gut dysbiosis. Sometimes there's leaky gut. Sometimes it's inflamed. Sometimes you have malabsorption, right? Sometimes you've developed food allergies. There can be a lot of variables and factors. And then you could have stress, chronic stress, neuroadrenal responses, right? You're kind of like neurologically overwhelmed. That's going to shut down some of the signaling to your digestive system, right? So things to think about. We've also got blood circulation. That's why if you've been around my world for any given period of time, you've been through my work at Modern Vitality, what we do is we look at a four-stage model, right? The first one's immune, then digestive, then neuroadrenal, then blood circulation. When we start at stage two, right? We start at digestion. Sometimes by skipping that first step, it's like you're trying to do a combination lock and you're just skipping the first number and just hoping that the door will open. Okay, yeah, cross your fingers, you know? Sometimes we get lucky, I guess, but for the most part, having a systematic process where you actually get the inflammation out in the first place may help the gut heal itself on its own and then the poops start changing, right? And then if that's not doing it all the way, then go to digestion. Use Chinese herbs, use special self-care practices, use specific breathing techniques, right? Not just what you learned at a general yoga class for the general public, but something specific and dialed in for the types of digestive issues that you're having with your whole constellation of symptoms and diagnosis all taken into account, right? Do those things, see how that does. And then just know that even if you've done immune and digestive and you're still not having the perfect poop, right? that may mean the answer for you lies in further stages. For example, stage three, when we get to neuroadrenal, and now you start to work on that stress response, that fight or flight, getting your shoulders out of your ears, right? Being able to expand your mind, expand your body, not be so rushed, not be so triggered, right? Have better boundaries with people, be able to take stress and overwhelm and all those things and be able to assimilate it and process it differently so that you're responding, not just reacting to everything. If you think that the training you do with your mind and your nervous system doesn't affect your guts and the poop coming out of you, right? Surprise, it does, okay? The vagus nerve, polyvagal theory, the ability to drop into a parasympathetic relaxed state where now the blood is flowing to the digestive organs and they're getting more electric attention from your brain. What do you think that's gonna do, right? Make you more healthy, <laughs> of course, right? You're gonna be pooping better, more regularly. Very interesting. So there is a four stage process. What tends to happen as people go through this is that not only they're pooping better, but now they're sleeping better, right? Now they're less inflamed, brain fog can go down, energy level can come up. It's all the things, right? You can't, I start this video talking about poop, right? But we can't ethically just talk about poop without getting into the context of every other symptom, all the body systems involved, no matter what the condition is, right? Literally like fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, adrenal fatigue, long haulers, candida, mold exposure, EMF sensitivity. It doesn't matter, right? We're talking about all this stuff because it, it, it all overlaps. Your body's a complex system. Once you understand that and you can zoom out and have the perspective to see there, there are all these things to handle, now the next thing is to organize it. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Now you got a plan. So. If you're struggling with complex chronic health conditions or trying to make the perfect poop, right? just know you don't have to do this alone. I've got a group. It's a lovely group. We're international and it's all people going through this type of process, right? All these different folks that are very positive and they're on various stages of their healing journey. They're lovely. They would love to talk to you. If you have any questions, you can come in. You can ask questions of the group. You can ask questions from me. I'm in there every day. It's free to join. I'll answer any question you've got. I'll give you my perspective. You get access to a whole vault of interactive videos I've put together for our members. There's a lot in there. So I would encourage you, go find the application. You can find it. It's below this video in the description and uh, fill it out. You know, take your time, be thoughtful with it. I'd like to actually get to know the person, right? Applying, it's important. We keep the group cozy. We keep it small. It caps out around one or 200 people. That way I know who's in there. And when you're asking me questions, I can answer very specifically for you in a way that's gonna help you get better. So because we keep it small, it can fill up, which then means there's a wait time. So please don't be discouraged. Just ask for a little bit of patience. I'll get you in as soon as I can, as long as your application looks like you're going to be a good fit. Might be a month or two. I try to get you in on the next monthly cohort if possible. So you're not just waiting forever. And in the meantime, feel free to subscribe to this channel. That way you can learn more helpful information like this video, right? Instead of scrolling a feed, which we all kind of do sometimes, right? Mindlessly just looking at things or watching TV or Netflix and just consuming that. 
you could hit subscribe and then you actually train YouTube to show you more videos that will help you get your health back. Isn't that cool? All right, let's get you feeling better. Cheers.